Good morning, good morning, saints. You are greeted this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We greet all of you that are coming to church for the first time this year. There's a scripture for you that we read in the book of Exodus chapter 12. God said to Moses, this month be a first month for you. It doesn't matter whether it's already March, but this month will be the first month for you. In other words, from now on, when you start your year, you are going to start the, your year on that month when God took you out of Egypt and sent you to the path to the promised land. Amen. We are grateful that you are here and we welcome our online audience. Thank you guys for joining us this morning on Facebook and on YouTube. We love this. We honor you. We're looking forward to see you in these premises or when we do our road meetings. We're looking forward to meet you in person in Jesus' name. Well, this morning, we are having a great weight that we are going to hear from God, and I trust that God is going to liberate you. He's going to set you free, and uh, you are going to walk out of this place with something substantial that is going to change, transform your life in Jesus' name. Amen. I have entitled my message that I believe I will be able to conclude it next week or a week after, and I've entitled my message, Endowed to be Competent. Endowed to be competent. Now, God has endowed you with gifts that you can be competent. Now, when you talk about endowment, we are talking about empowerment. If you are in politics, you will say, yes, empowerment. You are empowered to be competent. You are gifted, child of God, to be competent. You are blessed to be competent. In Genesis 1, 28, God blessed Adam and Eve, and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth and subdue. Now, the word bless there is the word authorize. He authorized them. And he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So you are, you are blessed. You are released by God to be competent. You are anointed with the anointing that will remove burdens and destroy yokes to be competent. You are commissioned by God to be competent. You are released by God to be competent. And not only that, but you are sent and you have been bestowed with necessary abilities and gifts, talents to be competent. So, in other words, you've got no choice but to be competent in life. I want to look at the scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5 and 6 in the NIV. It says, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the latter or the latter, but the spirit. For the latter kills, but the spirit gives life. Amen. So I'm here to say to you, children of God, Paul is writing to the Corinthians and say, we are not competent in ourselves, uh, but we are competent through the one that has called us. Now, he is the minister of the gospel, the minister of the new covenant, and he is competent in what he's called to do. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of competence. Okay? And you are not competent in your own strength. That's why I say you are endowed. You are gifted. You are blessed. You are anointed, commissioned, released. Send and you have been bestowed with gifts to be competent. Now, if you rely on the gift of the Holy Spirit, if you rely on heaven empowerment, listen to me, there is no way you are going to live your life being incompetent. Now, what is this competency we are talking about? To be competent means having the necessary ability, knowledge or skill to do something successful. Let me repeat this again. Competent means having the necessary ability, knowledge or skill to do something successfully. Now, when we talk about competency, we are talking about, number one, you've got to be skilled. In whatever you do, you've got to be skilled. Number two, you've got to have knowledge. Okay, now these two things, they don't come supernatural in most cases. Skill it's something that you have 
and you acquire skill through a lot of training. You've got to skill yourself and you make sure that you are at the right place at the right time so that you can receive skill. And knowledge is something that you also acquire. Now, the gift of knowledge, it is a gift that comes, but God expects you and I to go out there and, and make sure that we acquire knowledge through education and training. Now, when we talk about competency, about the combination of skill and knowledge, but that knowledge is not just a knowledge that is just scattered in your mind there and there, but it is knowledge that you are able to apply Okay, knowledge that you are able to apply. Now, when we talk about competence, it's someone who knows how to apply knowledge correctly and know how to employ their skill in a way that it will benefit them. Okay, so that's competence. Competence is the ability to combine your skill and knowledge and make this a combination that will bring fruit in your life. That is competency. Now, when we talk about competence, we are talking about someone who's qualified, someone who is skilled, someone who's good, proficient, uh, apt, accomplished, efficient. So that is competency. When we say you are competent, we mean you are qualified, you are skilled, you are good, you are proficient, you are, you are accomplished, you are efficient. So God is looking for people that he can trust with his creation. And he did not leave them, but he gives them the ability um, to be competent. Now, competency, ladies and gentlemen, it takes an effort. Competency, it takes an effort. It's not going to come to you by osmosis. It's not something that is just going to come and uh, it sits there. No, you've got to do something. Jesus gave a very powerful pro uh, parable of talents. He's, he, he, he's talking about three characters. The first one was given five talents. The second one was given two talents. The third one was given one talent. The one who had five talents, he went out there and he took his talents to work. He traded with his gift and then he made five more talents. The one who was given two, he did the same. He harvested two extra talents. But the one who was given one, he took the talent and he decided to sit on it, hide it, dig it, dig a hole and put it there. When the master comes and said to him, what, where is my investment? Because the God-given talent that you have is an investment of God on you so that you can make the earth a better place. So if you are going to sit on your gift, you are going to account before God. Amen. You are going to account before God. You are given that gift that you can make the earth a better place. Now, in the, in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, uh, reading from verse 16 through to verse 17, it talks about the word. We are given the word, that the word will, will be an instrument that God will use you to make you competent. Let's read. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, number one, for reproving, number two, for correction, number three, and for training in righteousness, number four. Now, for what? It says, for a man of God may be competent or, or complete, equipped for every good work. Now, God has given us his word that it will help us to, to, to be competent. God will use teaching to make you competent. So the word of God is profitable for teaching. You need to be taught, child of God. You can't just come and be a disciple and grow in the things of God um, unless you sit and, and allow someone to disciple you and teach you the principles of the word. We're not talking about being taught religion, but we are talking about being taught the word of God. Because the, the religion and the word, they are two different things. Religion is like a, a filter that you see God through. You see God through a filter. And that filter will make you see God the way you were taught, the way you were uh, uh, socialized, the way you were raised. And we were raised in different cultures. Sometimes we, when you come from a broken family, broken background, a culture of uh, abuse, a culture of not love, 
You will end up thinking God is a God who is angry, a God who wants you to tiptoe around him, and he's wearing his heart on the sleeves. A little thing you do and a little slip up, you are going to be harshly punished. That's not the God that I serve. God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. And God loved you the way you are. And he knows that you are a human being. You will make mistakes. And he will, when you repent and you come to him, he will embrace you. In the book of Luke, um, chapter 15, I think, it talks about a prodigal son who decided to take what was rightfully his, his inheritance. And he went to a far land and he used up all his inheritance. But when he made up his mind, the Bible says when he came back to his mind, Okay, when he came back to his senses, he went back to his father. When his father saw come, when he saw him come from a distance, he went and he embraced him. And he said to his father, I am not worthy to be called your son anymore. Make me one of your servants. And the father said, No, you remain a son. Even if you were lost, you were eating with pigs, you are still my son. So I'm saying to you, child of God, this morning, may you see God through the right filter. And that filter is when you are trained and, and you are taught the word of God. Number two, the Bible says the word of God is profitable for reproof. Amen. Sometimes we need to get people reproved because reproof is not a bad thing. It is a good thing that guides you and shows you that you are losing the way. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this, this practical example. You know, when, when, when you say no, and, and this is something that just comes, came to me during the week, that uh, when you say no, no is more liberating in most cases than saying yes. When, when somebody comes and say, can this and this uh, happen, and you say yes, but you don't want to say yes, you are actually putting a hard burden on yourself because the likeliness of you honoring that vow is actually 10%. But if you say no, it is say, it is more difficult to say no, but the no will liberate you because you, you don't have any obligation. And the one who's left with the burden is the one who's been rejected. A story that happened to us many years ago, um, it's almost about 20-something years ago, we were trying to purchase our first property for the church. I went to NetBank and tried to get a loan. When I got into the bank, I, they said to me, this is the office where you can go to get a house, a, a loan for the church. And when I walked in there, I said to this guy, good morning. My name is Eddie. I'm from, Gay I'm from Whitbank Christian Fellowship. Our church was called Whit Whitbank Christian Fellowship there. I'm trying to get a loan. This guy did not even look at me. He said, get out of my office. We don't deal with churches. Just like that, as rude as I'm saying it. I tell you, I was so upset. I was so offended. And amazingly that this man was a, he was taking his child to the same preschool where I was taking my son. I would see him every day and I would be so upset and offended. And this man did not even know me because he did not even look at me. But I knew him and it was, it was a pain in my heart. And let me tell you guys, the Holy Spirit had to reprove me. He had to reprimand me and say, you are carrying a burden you are not supposed to carry. Release this man so that I can bless you. So in most cases, we, we're carrying stuff we're not supposed to carry. So the word of God is there to reprove you. It's there to correct you nicely. Listen, nobody, nobody shouted at me as a release this anger. But when I was reading the Bible, I realized that I am delaying my progress by holding on to something that happened to me many years ago. And I'm praying for you this morning that may God set you free from the burden of rejection in the name of Jesus. Because sometimes God allows rejection because with the path you are taking, God wants to take you to a better path. He will close that door so that he can open the door. Amen. You're not hearing what I'm saying. God is an amazing God. And he's a God who does things if you believe in his promises. Amen. And then the word of God is there to train you in righteousness. Now, the word righteous means right standing with God. And the righteousness of God is not something that you achieve by works, but it's something that is given to you as a free gift. And the, the righteousness of God comes with God's standards, not with human standards. People think by you doing some things, it will make you less righteous. It doesn't exist in the Bible. 
because it is God's standards. And the God's standards can't be brought down by, by your human intervention because you did not achieve it by works. Anything you achieve by works, it can come down if you lower the standard, if you mess up, if you add something, it will go up, or if you remove something, then it will be lesser. But God's righteousness remain as it is because it is given by God. Amen. Hallelujah. So it is training men in righteousness. Now, what do I mean by righteousness? The reason why we don't know how to have faith in God is that every time when you understand and believe God for a breakthrough, the enemy comes and says, you don't deserve it because of what you did, what you said, uh, where you come from. But you've got to know, you've got to be trained in righteousness that when he said you are healed, you are healed in spite of other things. Are you not hearing me? Listen, when the Bible says we are given things by grace, grace means everyone has the same access. A guy who is a murderer, a guy who is a thief and a liar has the same access to the grace of God, but they have to access it by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The key here is faith. You've got to have faith. Jesus died for the people out there who are sinners, even those who are wizards and witches. He died for them. The reason they will go to hell is because they don't respond by faith and accept the free gift of God. So I'm saying to you, child of God, the word of God is there to train you in righteousness. Once you know you are the righteousness of God, you can pray bold prayers. You can pray knowing that you are under an open heaven. That's the word of God. So if you know the word, you are not going to pray apologetic, but you will know that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. My God has taken all sickness and disease from me. I am the head, not the tail. I'm above, not beneath. Why? Because you are trained in righteousness. You are not trained in religion because religion wants to condemn you. But righteousness wants to promote you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So it says for the men of God that can be complete. The men of God can be complete. Now that, that word complete there is the same word competent. That a man of God, a woman of God can be comp uh, competent. Now the word of God brings out competency in all of us. Now, let's look at Proverbs 18. Is it 18? Verse 9. 9. Yeah, it's verse 9. It's Proverbs 18, verse 9. All right? It says, he who is lawful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. In other words, if you are lazy, you are slothful, you are just like someone who is destructive. The people who are in the state capture, who stole our money, those that the SIU is after because they have stolen money that was meant for PPE, they are destroying the economy. But if you are lazy, employed, and you are not doing your work, you are just a check collector. You are just like those who are stealing. The Bible says you are a brother to a great destroyer. No, no, there's a quietness in the house. Even you guys who are watching us on, 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 on live stream, if you are not bringing your part, if God has given you a gift and you take that gift like that one with one talent, you sit on it. That's why the Bible says, take this man, this evil man, wicked man, the Bible calling him a wicked man, and throw him into hell. Why? Because this, you are like a destroyer. If you are slothful, you are not diligent in your work. You are a brother to a destroyer. Please underline that, underline or highlight that verse. Go read it again. I'm not making it up. Was that verse on the screen? Put it on the screen again. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9. So let's all of us read it. Can you guys put that verse on the screen? And I want all of us read it. And I want you to hear that scripture. Do we all believe the Bible? Yes. Can we all read? He who is slothful in his work 
is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. So don't be slothful. Don't be lazy. Don't be careless in your work. When you are given an opportunity, be diligent. The Bible says if you are diligent, you will have profit. But if you, you are just a mere talker, you are going to be poor. Yeah. <clears throat> Proverbs 22 verse 29. Proverbs 22 verse 29, it says, in the New Living Translation, do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. Now in the NIV, it says, do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. In other words, if you are competent, child of God, um, you might not be politically connected, but people will come looking for you because you are skilled. When Joseph was in prison, remember Joseph was a slave. He was not, a, he was not an Egyptian. He was a, a Jewish slave and a prisoner accused of rape but he was so competent that when pharaoh was looking around from his comrades who were politically connected those that he was giving contracts and tenders they could not help him they had to go look for someone who was in prison to come help them with the big problem that pharaoh had so if you are competent child of god they cannot ignore you they will go look for you even in places where you are retired and say we need your help so be skilled. Make sure that you up your skill. Make sure that you, when you do your work, you do it well. You are leaving a signature with your work. So you know in most cases, people are given work. And, and, and when they do it, they do it so shabby that we don't want to see them. I, I know people who build. I know people who are plumbers. I know people who are electricians. That people come and say, who helped you with this? So and so said, why do, do we have people who will travel from here to, the, to Limpopo to go build houses? There are other builders in Limpopo. It's because they say, I, I know how he builds. And I want you to go build my house in Limpopo. Why? Because of your work. Because of your skill. Why do we have people coming to South Africa to preach? Why do we have people uh, flying from South Africa to go to the U.S.? It's because of skill. You will not serve before low rank officials but you will serve before the kings because of your skill Amen. hallelujah now there are few characters in the bible that i want us to look at today who who were competent number one adam adam was very competent adam was very competent god gave adam the responsibility to name all the animals and the bible says all the animals he gave names, it was so. God did not second guess him. But whatever name that Adam gave to the animals, it was so. Not only that, but God allowed him to name even his partner. That when he woke up from that deep sleep and he saw Eve, he said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called a woman. So I'm saying to you, God will trust you with his creation if you are competent. Because he has created you with the ability to be competent. So incompetence is foreign to us, children of God. It is something that the enemy has brought in our lives. It's an invention. It is pollution from the, from the bottomless pit of hell. It has been brought by brokenness and pain. So if you deal with unforgiveness in your life, you will rise to a level of competency. In Jesus' name. The second guy here we read is Cain and Abel. The Bible says in the process of time, they went into their farming business. Abel was a livestock farmer and Cain was a, a crop farmer. And the Bible says, in the process of time, in other words, they went out, they worked their career, they worked their trade, and they brought their offering before the Lord. So you can't get a production if you are not competent. As a livestock farmer, you've got to work and bring your harvest. 
as a crop farmer, you must also work and bring your harvest. So you've got to be competent in what you do. You can't have profit if you're not competent. And how will you give your offering if there's no production? If there's no profit? If there's no profit, You've got to work and have profit in Jesus' name. Noah is a third character. I love the story of Noah because Noah was given dimensions of how he needs to build the ark. The kind of wood. Listen, for me, this is an engineering great design. That when he was building this ark, an ark is actually a huge boat. And then he was building it from the ground. He did not even have the hydraulic things to take it into the water. But the rain had to come and lift it up. It is, an, it's a, it is a scientific miracle. And not only that, this big boat was not empty. It was full of all sorts of animals, including your lions, your elephants, your rhinoceros, your, your giraffe, all big animals like your crocodiles, your buffaloes were there. And but this thing, when it rains, it managed to float. The kind of wood that he used was a wood that did not absorb water. But all these days, this wood was able to lift this thing and keep it suspended and floating in the water. That's competency right there. That's competency right there. We've got to think about competency. That God will not embarrass you and give you a project that will fail. That is that now they say, oh, let's run around. Noah's ark is sinking. People are about to die. Animals are about to drown. No, that's not the kind of thing that God is talking about. It had three levels. And in all the levels, there will be different animals. And those animals will not break down and fall into the lower level. That's how God wants you to do things. You've got to be competent in whatever you do. And then the next guy is Abraham. Abraham had 318 men born in his house. When he was told that Lot was conquered by the enemy, he sent the 318 trained security guys. They went out, they fought against five kings, defeated them, brought Lot back and the spoilers. That's competency. That's competency. Guys, I'm telling you, if you want to succeed in life, if you want to be noticeable in life, if you want to trend in life, not trend doing negative things, but you want to be known and be paid for your face to be on social media, you've got to be competent. People will not come and invest their money on something that is not up to standard. Whatever you are selling, you've got to sell it well. You've got to do it in the competent way, children of God. Now, I, I want us to look at this last character that is Isaac. And, and I, I want us to think about it as, as we go into the book of Genesis chapter 26 from verse 17. Isaac, the Bible says he was in the land of the Philistines and they had to chase him away. They said, you are too strong for us. You are too rich for us. They said, leave our land. Now in, 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 in Genesis Chapter 26 from verse 17. Can we all look at that passage as I read? It says, so Isaac moved away to Gera. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. Isaac's servants also dug in the Gera Valley and discovered a well, fresh water. But when the shepherds from Gera came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said. And they argued over it with Isaac's headsman. So Isaac named the well Essek, which means argument. And Isaac's men then dug another well, but again there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sidna, which means hostility. Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. This time there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space. For, the law, for he said, at last the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper 
in this land. Now, the Bible talks about Isaac in the same chapter when you read from the first verse. It says, in the same year uh, when there was drought, Isaac planted a seed. He began to prosper. He continued prospering until he was very prosperous. Now, sometimes we don't understand. We think it was by confession. Isaac did not prosper when there was famine in the land because he made confession. No, Isaac, when there was famine in the land and he prospered after planting a seed, he knew a secret of being a well digger. He learned that skill from his father that when there's no rain from heaven, we can dig the wells and water our plants. And the Bible says he was prosperous. And I'm telling you, in this season when there's lockdown, unemployment, uh, COVID, you've got to have a skill to succeed. Without a skill, you will be a pauper. So you've got to work and pray and think about what can you offer in this season for you to succeed. Money will not fall from heaven like manna, but you've got to have a skill you can trade. Because, listen, the skill you have, you trade, then you get money. That's very, very important for you to understand, children of God. And people think we're going to come to church and come. Church is going to be a place of amen, dancing and shouting only. Church is a place of being empowered. That you've got to think outside the box. You've got to use your brain cells and say, what can I do with my skill? What can I do? What is it that I can do that is needed in this season under an open heaven? The heavens are open, but you've got to think about something you can do that can profit you. Isaac planted the seed in the same year of famine, and he began to prosper. He continued prospering until he was very prosperous. How did he do that? He opened the well, the skill he learned from his father. But it was not easy. Look at this scripture. The Bible says uh, the Philistines decided to close those wells after Abraham died. You, you will always have an enemy who would want to sabotage you. But you don't focus on the sabotage of the enemy. But you rise above the sabotage of the enemy. If, if you are going to focus on what the enemy is doing, you are not going to grow. The enemy has been there from the time of Adam and Eve. In the garden, the enemy is still here. You must prosper in the presence of the enemy. In the book of Psalms 23, the Bible says, He, he will prepare the table in the presence of your enemies. So don't focus on the enemy. Eat your food because God has prepared the table. Where? In the presence of your enemies. Your enemies might be roaring around like a lion. Don't focus on what the enemy is doing. Eat your food because he has prepared a table. It's a battle that is constant. It will not change. It will be like this until you go. All the people that are successful in life who have left a mark in this world, they had enemies. And you don't know about it because they are not glorifying their enemies. Their enemies were as powerful as they were in those days, but their enemies are not recorded. Only their legacy is recorded. We are, we are not talking about the enemy of Martin Luther. We are not reading about the enemy of Nelson Mandela. But there were people who were opposed to him and they were as influential as Nelson Mandela. But history has eliminated them. Only those that are doing the right thing will remain in the, in the books of history. Hallelujah. Now the Bible says here, and Isaac... And his uh, workers, they opened a well. They dug a well in the valley of Gera. And immediately when they dug that well, the Philistines, they came and they said, this is our well. They started arguing. And the Bible says when Isaac saw that, the Bible says he named that well Essek place of argument. And I'm telling you guys, there are a lot of Christians who are stuck in Essex. You are stuck in argument. This is mine. This is mine. This is mine. And, and you are not going forward. You are stuck in argument. And you are not going forward. But Isaac he did what? He named that well. After he opened that well and he, they, they said it's our well. He did not want to entertain this argument. He left it. There are things you've got to leave. Instead of you getting in an argument for the rest of your life,